uh, Ms. Madrid mentioned, I'm a, a neuroscientist or more specifically a neuropharmacologist. And I'm really excited to like chat with uh, the um, Culver City High School students. My daughter pre-COVID used to run track um, at the um, really nice tracks you guys have over there. And I, one thing I can say is that you guys kill when it comes to athletics as well as uh, academics. So it's really um, very excited to be here. And also, you know, I would really, really love for this to be interactive because, you know, I know what I do, but I really want to have these discussions around what you want to know about. Uh, I've put together a few slides just to um, go over my career path and kind of what I do on a daily, but I would love for you to, um, you know, kind of interrupt, ask questions. Um, I'm, I've snuck in three um, questions in there and the first person to uh, get them right, um, I'm going to send, email them a little gift. So just, uh, you know, I'll give you, I'll let you know when uh, this, uh, this uh, little uh, t uh, quiz uh, uh, is um, comes up. So let me share my slide um, here. Share my screen. Let's see. So as uh, hmm. as uh, Miss Madrid men mentioned, I am a um, neuroscientist, neuropharmacologist. I have a PhD in my area of specialty, and I currently work for Genentech, which is the largest biotech company in the world, as my, uh, my title is a Senior Medical Science Liaison, and I'm a part of their field medical team. So just a um, quick question, how many of you, I'm sure most of you know what a neuroscientist is, how many know what a neuropharmacologist is? Maybe, um, I can't really read the chat, but when I'm presenting at the same time. I can monitor the chat. I can monitor the chat. Or if anybody wants to unmute themselves and say an answer. Yeah. That works but, too, but chat. Oh, I see the chat here. Yeah. Okay. Well, no, I, I can't really see it, but. Uh, so Francisco says medicine for the brain. Mm-hmm, yeah. Any other answers? <laughs> yeah, oh. sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so she doesn't know until now. So, okay, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's very good. So, um, you know, pharmacology is a branch of medicine that studies drugs. So it's the study of uh, what drugs do to your body and then what your body does to the drug. So that's pharmacology. The evil twin of pharmacology is toxicology because, you know, as you know, every drug has a desired effect and also an undesired effect. So pharmacology, toxicology go together. And neuroscience is a study of the brain. So I specialize on drugs for neurological diseases. So I work in the drug development space. I um, did not go to high school in the US. I went to high school in uh, Stockholm, Sweden. I went to an international high school and uh, did the International Baccalaureate. I do believe some LA schools offer that program. Um, I, I think El Segundo does, maybe I think um, Westlake Village, uh, Thousand Oaks, those are the ones that I know of, but uh, it's, uh, it's an international program and part of the program, you um, choose six subjects. So three that are um, like higher level subjects and three lower level subjects, so I think my understanding is that the high level subjects are uh, equivalent to maybe uh, AP classes. So my, uh, I chose uh, chemistry, biology, and math as my um, higher uh, classes. And you have to take a test, uh, you know, all the students across the world take the same test. And um, I chose these subjects because I knew in high school that I wanted, I was really, really interested in science, but I didn't know uh, what, what type of scientist I wanted to be. I, you know, I didn't know if I wanted to be an engineer or maybe a doctor or maybe a research scientist. So, you know, I took this uh, wide range, uh, not wide, but, you know, chemistry, biology, and math. Um, and uh, here's a photo of my high school. Uh, back then we didn't appreciate it, but now I think it kind of looks a little bit like a European uh, manor house, maybe, or castle or something like that, very classic uh, high school. So once I graduated from high school, 
I um, was told to apply to one um, college because uh, my parents thought I was very young and not old enough to uh, be away from home. And they had uh, moved, we moved to the United States. So um, I applied to one university and I got in. So this is, the next slide is going to be my first uh, question for a gift, for the gift. So the first student who can guess which university this building is from and extra points if uh, you know the architect. This is a very famous building uh, designed by one of the most famous American architects. Not living though. Any guesses? Uh, Miss Madrid, you're you're on. Um, okay. I don't have anybody on uh, that has answered yet. Maybe you can give a clue or a hint. Okay, I'll give a clue. Uh, it is a Pac-12 school, so it's Pac-12. So you get, you know, 12, 12 guesses. <laughs> I don't see any any okay. answers coming through yet. All right, might be too hard. It's an, oh, it's an, sorry. Uh, yeah, you don't count, Mr. Uh, White. <laughs> <laughs> did he guess it right? What did he guess? I don't know. He said University of Washington. No. Okay. I'll, I'll keep giving guesses until someone guesses it. Uh, it's one state over. So it's a Pac-12, but one state over because Washington's two states over. Uh, narrows it down. So it's not in California. Any guesses? It's in... Arizona. Oh, well, you want what university it was. Yes, what university it was, yeah. All right, you guys start guessing. Arizona State? Yes, yes. So whoever Madison. guessed Arizona State. Madison. All right, Madison, you got it. Madison. Okay, Madison uh, gets that, um, that one right. So this is actually uh, a famous auditorium on campus. It's a famous building, actually. It's called the Gamage Auditorium, and it was designed by one of the most famous uh, U.S. architects known uh, called Frank Lloyd Wright. And a lot of his works were in the Southwest. And I remember the first time I uh, drove up to this to campus and I saw this building and I thought, oh, my God, this is just magical. But uh, so that's where I did my undergrad. I, as an undergrad, I studied um, chemistry. So my undergrad major was chemistry. During my undergrad, I, some of the activities that I did that kind of helped me along my path, I, I volunteered at a elementary school um, teaching um, children with uh, learning disabilities. So that was really, really rewarding uh, to me because when I, you know, I remember when I first started um, volunteering, some of the students uh, with special needs, you know, they were, they were kindergartners and first graders. It was one little boy, he, he, didn't, he couldn't count to 10. And, um, you know, just after a couple of months, not only was he, you know, counting to 100, but he was really excelling. Um, so that was really, really very rewarding to me. And so that was uh, um, some volunteer work I did. I also started volunteering at the Barrows Neurological Institute. Um, Arizona State University does not have a school of medicine. So an opportunity to, um, to do research or to volunteer in a hospital was not necessarily linked to the university at the time when I was there. Things might have changed, but um, just across town was uh, the Barrow Neurological Institute, which I believe is one of the largest neurological institutes in the um, in the world. I think they do more um, um, neurosurgeries than any other uh, su center. So I started volunteering there um, twice a week. You know, early morning, 7.30 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. before uh, before my classes. I volunteered there for, uh, you know, almost a year. And uh, the exciting thing was that I got my own project, a little project uh, to measure protein levels uh, of a particular protein that's associated with uh, nicotine. It was the nicotine receptors. Um, and that translated into a paid summer internship my senior year uh, as an undergrad. And that really, really um, kind of opened a lot of doors for me. So having a summer a research internship 
as well as having a mentor who wrote uh, letters of recommendations really um, kind of, um, yeah, like I said, you know, opened a lot of opportunities, a lot of doors for me. Uh, the, my mentor at Barrett Neurological Institute was a renowned neuroscientist. And when I applied for graduate schools, um, almost every school, uh, a professor knew him. And so it was like, well, you know, if he thinks you're good, then, you know, we're definitely, um, you know, gonna um, talk, wanna talk to you more. Uh, as an undergrad, also, I was a teaching assistant, so I taught the chemistry labs. I taught two chemistry labs, so chemistry for uh, non-majors. It's a little bit challenging because many of them did not want to go into science. They were required to take uh, uh, so one science class and biology had filled up, so they were, uh, you know, signed up for chemistry. But, you know, that was really fun, too, because... Um, uh, you know, just, just exposing students who are not necessarily interested in science, but exposing them to science was really uh, quite rewarding. I was also a tutor. I tutored math, science, and English. And my final year, um, a senior in college, I um, was a peer advisor. So I lived in the freshman dormitories and, um, you know, advised um, a lot of the uh, freshmen on um you know, different career paths and how they can better, um, you know, um, just uh, learn skills that will help them later on um, in their in their careers. Um, you know, I'm going to pause here. Any questions? Please feel Mr. free to unmute. Yeah, Mr. White asked a question about would you ever go back to teaching? Did you find it rewarding? You know, I, I did. I, I really did enjoy teaching very much. And I... Uh, what I enjoyed about it is because, you know, so a lot of, a lot of students came into chemistry class, you know, like I said, you know, they, they were non-majors, you know, they were like English majors or political science or sociology, and they came in with this fear of chemistry. They came in with a fear of math. And, you know, just, I enjoyed explaining science in a way that they could you know, kind of relate to, for example, uh, you know, how many chemistry students in here, like, you know, rate limiting a factor here, or rate, rate limiting, limiting reaction, you know. Um, so I would just use analogies that they could relate to because, you know, if you told them, you know, you have uh, two molecules of hydrogen and one molecule of oxygen, you know, it's just like, oh, you know, they, they don't want to hear that. But I'm like, listen, how many slices of bread do you need to make seven sandwiches? You know, if you have uh, five slices of cheese and 13 slices of uh, bread, I mean, how many sandwiches can you make? What's the limiting, rate limiting uh, product here? So, um, so, you know, things like that, they're like, oh, okay. So I did really, really enjoy that. And if you have an opportunity uh, in high school to tutor, or uh, to teach when you're in college, even, uh, even if it's uh, teaching laboratories, uh, then I you know, highly encourage you to do so because uh, the best way to learn yourself is to teach. Um, any other questions? Yeah, there's another question in the chat. Um, what would you recommend for people interested in neuroscience or psychology? Like what math classes would you yeah, recommend? So Absolutely. So, you know, if you want to go into neuroscience uh, or uh, psychology, you don't need to take as much math as a chemistry major needs to. So, you know, I, I believe as uh, for biology and psychology, well, at least for biology, I believe, you know, going up to calculus is, uh, is, is good. Whereas for chemistry, you went up to differential equations and partial differential equations. So, you know, some calculus really does help you in biology because people think of biology as more descriptive. But, uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, reactions um, and biochemical processes that uh, you, you, you will have a much better understanding if you have a solid math background. Okay, and then one other question. Did you um, experience any discrimination being a female in science or while you're in school or in the field? I, I did. I did. Absolutely. So, you know what? Um, I'll tell you about my application for grad schools and then I'll tell you what kind of uh, 
some of the discrimination I faced. Um, uh, so, uh, so I, my senior year, I started applying for graduate school. So I thought about what I wanted to do. You know, medical school was an option or a career path that interested me and then a research path. Um, I took the uh, test for medical school as well as the test for, um, for graduate school. And I did fine in, um, in both areas, but at that time I thought really long and hard and I decided for me, I really, really like, enjoyed being in the lab, lab and really being behind the scenes and uh, coming up with um, drugs and coming up with uh, something really novel that physicians could use down the road for their patients. So that was what motivated me. And I, that's when I decided to apply for graduate schools. Uh, part of the process of application was, like I said, uh, taking these, um, the GRE, you know, um, having a solid GPA. You know, I, I'll admit, you know, I did not have a 4.0 GPA, either, uh, uh, you know, graduating from college. And, um, and that was fine. And I will explain to you why it was okay that, you know, I graduated mostly with A's, some B's, and I even had a C. And, um, you know, I'll tell you why, um, when I applied to graduate schools, that was, um, you know, um, not held against me. Uh, a part of the application process, and I'm sure some of you are already um, have gone through this or going through this right now, you know, you apply to some shore schools, like schools that you think you can really, you know, you can easily get into, um, ones that, you know, kind of medium level, and then um, some that are, you know, a kind of a dream. So I um, applied to a handful of schools, maybe like six schools, and I was um, called for interviews at three of them. And so part of the interview process is they bring you into their university and as much as they're checking you out and interviewing you, it's also an opportunity for you to um, check out that university to see if it's going to be a good fit because you're going to be spending a lot of time over there. They're going to be your like uh, family away from your family. So, um, you know, I did get accepted into uh, my first choice. It wasn't necessarily the first choice of my advisors, and um, but uh, it was the school that I had dreamt uh, of uh, attending. I got a uh, full full scholarship and a stipend. And um, so about this about the discrimination, I remember when uh, I was accepted into this um, well known university, very uh, reputable department with a scholarship. What I heard. Uh, which was very hurtful at the time was um, when you only got in because you're a woman. You got oh, you only got in because you're a person of color. And uh, you know I didn't really want to engage too much, but uh, you know uh, I would sometimes say, well, how many of you are uh, volunteering? How many of you have two jobs? Uh, how many of you are working as hard as I'm working? And at on, during my graduation, um, I, I graduated with honors and I had this yellow tassel and, you know, that's when I was like, well, where's your yellow tassel? You know, you're here asking, you know, suggesting that I only got accepted because I'm a woman. Um, so, um, and then the other funny thing was, I remember as a chemistry undergrad, and I think things have come a long way. I was an undergrad before you, you all were born, but, um, we were very few women in the program and in the beginning of um uh, school uh, like any any class the some of the male students would come up to us and say you know hey do you want to copy our homework um hey do you want to copy our homework and so that was really it was nice but um you know towards the end of the class they knew that um two of us were top of the class so then it was kind of like hey can we copy your homework so, um, you, I mean, these are, I guess, what would you call microaggressions? Maybe some of it was over when, you know, they would come and say, you know, you they would actually say, you only got in because you're a woman. So, and um, 
I have another Any question. Other. Yeah, there's questions that came through. Um, what made you choose neuropharmacology and not like neurosurgeon or neurologist? And maybe the differences, yeah. maybe you could talk a little bit about the differences. Absolutely. So a, a neurosurgeon goes through medical school and then seven years of post-medical school training and uh, they perform surgeries um, on the brain. Uh, a neurologist goes through medical school and then a three-year uh, residency and they don't do surgery but they treat um, uh, treat neurological disorders. So they work directly with patients. Uh, one as a surgeon, the other one more um, managing uh, neurological disorders through, uh, you know, the diagnosing and through medications. What a neuroscientist does is we're in the laboratory uh, doing the research, understanding uh, the pathology of the diseases, understanding, um, uh, you know, just really what goes wrong. Um, and at the time that I was applying for graduate school, there was like neuroscience was the last frontier of medicine. There was not much known about uh, neuroscience or neurology. Just, you know, if you can, you can imagine that uh, the brain is really difficult to study because, you know, um, you can't just go into a patient brain and uh, see what's going on. So, um, it was really the last frontier and the back then the kind of joke about neurology or neuroscience or neurology was uh, it's diagnose and adios. Like, yeah, sure. You have this debilitating neurological disorder, but we have nothing for you. And, you know, some, some neurological disorders uh, still remain that way. But, you know, for me, I wanted to be part of, um, the team or uh, the effort to come up with medications for these diseases. So does that explain kind of the differences? Uh, and so and as a neuroscientist, I uh, did my PhD. Okay, and there's a, yeah, there was a question about how many years in school were you to, be, to get a PhD? And do you think it was worth it? Okay, sure. You know what, let me see, uh, I'll go over, the next uh, next slide, and then uh, I can quickly tell you how long I was there. So, who knows what this building is? First person to guess right. Uh, where this, like, which university this is? UCLA. Yes, yes, UCLA. It's a UCLA South Campus. It's the Center for Health Sciences. So I joined the um, department there at UCLA as a graduate student. All right, Ingrid, thank you. Congrats. <laughs> See you. Congrats. Um, so I, I joined the UCLA School of Medicine and um, did my PhD in uh, neuropharmacology. So part of the training was uh, one to two years of uh, coursework. And then you do a qualifying exam, you know, kind of like a, a, a written and an oral exam. You do uh, three laboratory rotations. So, um, so you can find a lab that um, is a good match, a good fit for you. So I um, rotated to, th to three different labs and I uh, ended up being in a lab or I chose to be in a lab that did research on a, a central nervous system depressants. And um, I think I mentioned a, a full scholarship. So um, that department, uh, many departments only accept PhD students that they can support, that they can fund. And uh, many other departments will also have opportunities for PhD students to uh, teach, be a teaching assistant or research assistant. Many of them um, will TA um, medical students so, you know, medical students will take an uh, uh, array of subjects like physiology, pathology, pharmacology, and then the PhD students who are specializing in that particular um, branch will, will TA the, um, the, the medical students. Um, half, about three years into um, research, you take an exam where you have a thesis proposal 
And then at the end of your time, um, you have to complete a uh, thesis, which is, uh, has to be a original work that um, advances science and is uh, published in peer reviewed journal. My PhD uh, thesis was biochemical mechanisms of tolerance to chronic benzodiazepine exposure, which uh, benzodiazepines are drugs like Valium and, um, and Xanax and drugs like that. And so I wanted to research to see why people become um, kind of addicted to them. And then you do your PhD, uh, you do a presentation in public, and then you go behind closed doors and your um, uh, committee, you have a committee of professors that examine you and then they either pass you or they don't. So the average time in my um, program was six and a half years after undergraduate. I, it took me about six years. Uh, do I think it was worth it? 100%. You know, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, it was challenging. It was grueling. I knew at UCLA Medical Center, uh, or the, back then the medical center was in the same building, all the security staff, because they would see me at all hours of the day, at night. Um, you know, I think of it as um, kind of like a distance runner. You know, you, it's, you have to enjoy every mile. You know, you have to enjoy the process, uh, not only the, the end goal if that makes sense. So if, if you need, you just have to be prepared for a long training and independent training. Um, unlike some other um, fields like pharmacy school or medical school, dental school, nursing school, you know, you have set curriculum, you know, you pass your exams, you can graduate in four years or six years. With PhD, you only graduate when um, you've done something that's original and that contributes to an advanced science. Any other questions? Yeah, there was something that came in about, um, do you believe that having a certain degree for a specific category prevents the ability to have a job or career that doesn't have much to do with your degree? So you mean, um, like, are we too specialized maybe? Yeah, I wasn't quite sure what that meant. So I asked for clarification. Um, if you uh, want to specify, but yeah, I guess, sure. Um, how, answer however you think <laughs> you want to answer that question. So, um, yeah, I think, are we, am I too specialized? I don't think so because having gone through undergrad and having gone through the training, I'm, can do any job that requires uh, an undergrad degree. So if, you know, I, if I want to become, uh, I had a, I had a coworker who became a high school science teacher because that's what she wanted to do. So it didn't prevent her uh, from doing so. Or, um, you know, if I want to become a lab technician, you know, I can do that, but I can also do jobs that require even more, uh, maybe more advanced, uh, advanced training. And, um, and part of my career since I became a scientist, most of it was spent on um, neuropharmacology, but I'll tell you, I spent three years working on hepatitis C and HIV. And I was able to do that because um, my foundation allowed me to, to, to work in these other uh, therapeutic areas or diseases. Because you know a lot of the physiology of cells, whether it's a brain cell or it's a kidney cell or a liver cell, uh, you know they operate very similarly. Thank you. So. Um, oh, I think there was some clarification here. So having a degree in, like, say, psychology. Yeah. So having a degree in psychology does prevent you from being a scientist. And I would say yes, right? Is that correct? You have to go, you have to take science classes and become a scientist or two different careers. Um, you know, I, I think you know, I don't, it doesn't prevent you, but you might just have to take some additional 
uh, courses um, than just your core psychology curriculums. Um, I, I believe, yeah. Just, I think you might have to take a few more. I mean, it really varies from university to university, but uh, uh, yeah, you might have to do a couple more, um, couple of additional classes that's not, you know, um, core to the psychology curriculum. Okay, and then along those, I did get another question. Would there still be, you have to have a, to call yourself a neuroscientist, do you have to have a PhD? The question came in about, is there a, a range of job opportunities for someone who did not get a PhD? And can they be a neuroscientist without the PhD title? Well, you know, so, I, you know, I don't think that's kind of regulated per se. I always thought um, that in order to call yourself a scientist or a neuroscientist, you had to have a PhD. But, you know, I don't think, you know, this is in any way being regulated. And I've uh, since um, met people and heard of people who, uh, you know, um, are scientists or call themselves scientists who do, do not necessarily have a PhD. So, you know, I'm not here to kind of exclude anybody. Um, uh, they, you know, there's a neuroscience undergrad program. So when I started graduate school at UCLA, I think that was the first class, graduating class uh, of neuroscience undergrad. Um, so you, you can do, you can study psychology or uh, neuroscience or biology or um, chemistry or physics or engineering and then um, take the required classes and go to any path that you like, if, um, if that makes sense. So yes, actually with an undergrad, I think there are a lot of jobs that you can do. Like you can be a um, lab technician, you can work in these big laboratories, you can work at companies, you can work, um, you know, people, will, people say that it's actually easier to get a job as a uh, lab technician than it is as a, um, you know, more specialized research scientist. You can be, uh, let me think, um, you can be a, a high school um, teacher. What are some of the other things? Dr. Mr. White, maybe <laughs> help me out over here. <laughs> um, well, well, you know, I was, I was actually thinking of an example of how it's helped me, uh, uh, me being specialized as a certified athletic trainer. So I, I would have never thought that I would have been teaching. So because of my athletic training certification, uh, I was able to take that certification. And then when, when the uh, career uh, technical education program opened up, I was able to begin teaching. And I would never uh, have known teaching if that opportunity wouldn't have opened up and, uh, and I did have my uh, degree in something totally different like athletic training. So in, in, in regards to uh, uh, Harry's question, I think that uh, you should uh, definitely choose a career pathway that you're interested in, but knowing that in the, you know, in the long run, you're never going to know where it's going to take you. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. That's, thank you for that. Um, yeah, there, there, there are a lot of, um, lot of different careers. Um, you can work in diagnostics, you know, um, these, um, uh, the blood labs. I know people who work in those and, you know, they find it very fulfilling as well. So, um, yeah. And uh, one more question that came through. Do you, do you travel a lot for your business and to see how the medicines of that I guess you've worked on affect other people in different countries. Yeah, absolutely. You know what, I my last slide, I'm just quickly gonna go over what I do uh, in my current role. And um, before that, I have one more, one more test, one more question. Um, you know, I just threw the second photo in here uh, just because that's my, uh, <laughs> my cover publication. So, you know, in, in, in the scientific world, that's like my little, um, you know, what do you call it, Oscar or Grammy award. But um, as, so uh, I think maybe uh, without getting too technical. So there are different ways to slice a brain or to view a brain, different sections. There's, um, I'm just going to name them. 
um, coronal, sagittal, and vertical. What kind of section do you think this this brain is? I'm mean, this is actually not a brain. This is a uh, painting of a brain that I have on my wall. But between sagittal, coronal, and vertical, because the the words I'll kind of like are clues in themselves. Uh, our first answer is vertical. Mm -mm. Second answer, well, that, you don't count, Mr. White. Um, sagittal, sagittal. Yes, that's right. And um, the, the way I remember this is, um, and a lot of, you know, a lot of scientists won't know this, but the way I remember this is, you know, I think about uh, Sagittarius, you know, with the bow, like, Sagittal mean so it's sliced this way, like with a bow. Coronal, and everybody know what, knows what Corona uh, means now because of coronavirus, but uh, is, a, is like the sun, right? So if I were to sl slice the brain this way, it would look like that. So more like a sun. So that's a coronal. And, uh, and then the other one would be, wait, wait, sorry, this way longitudinal vertical yeah longitudinal like that so whoever guessed right gets the gift card harry you run Good, harry. so yeah so once i did my phd so there are different career paths for me you know one was to be a professor a research scientist a lecturer you know so uh, i had uh, classmates that uh, were um teaching at community colleges or uh, uh, at universities, more of administrative type of roles. There are different paths. Um, let me think. So I um, stayed in research as a research faculty. And then I, a um, few years later, I um, joined um, the pharmaceutical biotech world. So while I was at UCLA, um, some of the research that I'm really proud of is, I don't know um, uh, if many of you might have seen this and heard about this uh, research in the news, but really um, I, I did research on spinal cord injury. I was one of six scientists in a, in a group and our research really has um, helped in terms of uh, finding ways to improve uh, recovery from spinal cord injuries, helping patients to walk again or to have limb movement again. So this is um, the group that I was a part of at UCLA. Did, what, were, what were some of the questions, Ms. Madrid? I might have been forgetting. Travel. Oh, um, the last one was about traveling and how you could see the medicines you, I guess you worked on or clinical trials were affecting the different people in different countries. You get to see yeah. the results. Absolutely. So, you, so I currently work for uh, the biggest biotech company in the world, Genentech. Uh, biotech is a little bit different than pharma. Uh, pharma works with small chemicals that are dr drugs that are small chemicals. Biotechnology is more. We work with drugs that are living things like proteins and antibodies and things like that. So that's a little. Uh, that's why we call ourselves a biotech because most of our drugs are. Um, living. Um, I do uh, travel quite a bit or pre-pandemic I traveled quite a bit because a lot of what I did was uh, present at conferences. So I would go uh, attend uh, national and international conferences. A lot of my work is uh, sharing um, our clinical data and research data with other with neurologists and other scientists. And uh, in the uh, last how many, however many years or so. In the last eight years, I've worked on diseases such as multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, neuromyelitis optica, migraine, myasthenia gravis, and um, let me see. Uh, these are the um, different drugs that I've worked on. Uh, one was a paradigm shifting drug for multiple sclerosis. So there's a type of multiple sclerosis um, known as primary progressive, the mo more aggressive form of multiple sclerosis. This is the first drug ever approved and uh, the only drug to this day approved for uh, multiple sclerosis. 
I worked on another um, drug for multiple sclerosis, which is an oral medication. This one is an infusion. I worked um, on a migraine drug that was approved a uh, couple years, almost two, three years ago now, um, which was a first in class, meaning it was the first drug that used a new a mechanism of action. And then last, um, last summer approved a drug for uh, a, a rare neurological disorder, disorder called NMOSD. So I don't work directly with patients, but uh, when I travel and I speak with neurologists, they share with me their experiences and their patients' experiences on these medications. So just um, last week, I met with a neurologist who told me this drug, this MS drug, uh, he said, you know, 30% of, not only does it stop the progression of multiple sclerosis, you know, keeps people from uh, needing canes and wheelchair, but it actually, he said in 30% of his patients, which our data does support this, that patients actually see an improvement. You know, someone walking with a cane, no longer needing a cane. Um, so um, he shares that. I, I don't present to patients, but... Um, in my daily life, I sometimes, when people find out what I do, they share with me how their, um, uh, the, the drugs that I've worked on has so much impacted their lives. So I've had people tell me that, you know, uh, the migraine drug, they, you know, it was debilitating and it really, really changed the quality, quality of their life. And this is a story I shared with uh, Miss Madrid, um, and again, you know, my, my job is not to work with, um, with patients directly. So the reward is really not a more immediate, like with a neurologist or a physician, you know, uh, a direct reward. But I shared with Ms. Madrid that in our local, in our neighborhood where we're neighbors, I was sitting at a restaurant at the bar eating and I met this gentleman who uh, was a musician and he was just chatting. And he started telling me that his wife has multiple sclerosis and, um, and she, she has that very, very aggressive form of multiple sclerosis. Um, she had spent many years in a wheelchair and they were actually contemplating, uh, he's from Switzerland, uh, going to Switzerland and uh, doing assisted suicide. But then he said that in, um, at that time, he, you know, he said, you know, just recently there was a drug that was approved. My wife got a dose of that drug. And now not only is she feeling better, she has no pain. Um, she has a lot more energy. She, um, she's happier, but she actually started working 20 hours a week. So she's working part time. And so um, just hearing that just really, really was, you know, the reward that I need it, not needed, but like, just it was more um, rewarding than, than I can even express to, to hear something like that. And so, um, yeah, um, that's, that's when I do get to see the impact of the drugs that, you know, when I say I, I mean we as a team. So I'm part of a bigger team. I'm one of the principals on a bigger team, but you know, um, uh, we get to uh, to really um, have some some kind of satisfaction from knowing that all of the hard work is um, is being um, you know patients are benefiting from it. And do you um, go over just a couple things about MS and what it is and what it does to the body, just in, in case no someone doesn't know what that is? Yeah. So multiple sclerosis. Yeah, I should have explained. So multiple sclerosis is uh, a uh, disease where your immune system starts attacking itself. So you have, your immune system gets confused. So your immune system is supposed to fight uh, viruses and bacteria and external things, uh, but it gets confused and starts attacking itself. In the case of um, multiple sclerosis, it starts attacking what's the myelin sheath. So this is, um, uh, you, uh, it, it's, it's a sheath that covers neurons. And so when that is, when the myelin sheath is broken down, it forms lesions in the brain. So multiple sclerosis patients, if you look at their uh, brain in, you know, within an MRI, uh, they have lesions 
throughout their brain. Um, so these lesions cause uh, them to have physical disability, um, ranging from you know difficulty walking to needing a cane to being in a um, wheelchair, uh, and then completely debilitated. It's associated with pain, uh, fatigue, depression, cognitive um, uh, deficits, all of that. So it is a really um, at one time it was a extremely debilitating uh, disease where you would end up in a wheelchair, 100%. But today with all the, with new medications, um, they're able to, to, if the patient is well managed, really, 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 uh, not only slow down, but you know, stop the progression of the disease and it's, you know, it's kind of in its track. Thank you for that clarification. Um, I just, I had a couple more questions come through um, along those lines. Of, well, one, is there a difference between education in Europe versus US compare? And then the other question, um, do you believe in mind over matter, like tricking the human brain into believing your body is fine? Um, does that ever work or just solve issues like paralysis and that kind of thing? Or do you know people that are working on that? Yeah, um, so yeah, really good question. So in Europe, <clears throat> so um, just education as a whole or um, scientific education, I think scientific training is very similar, you know, similar process. And uh, I know this because um, when I meet with scientists from other countries, not just Europe, but from South America, from Asia, from Africa, we speak the same language. So that tells me our training is, uh, is, is fairly similar. Um, I think you have excellent universities and excellent training, you know, all over the world, but the U S really is, uh, does, does lead a lot of the way in terms of, um, drug discovery. It's just, um, you know, we have some of the, uh, the best minds, here in the U.S. working. Um, so um, that's, what was the second question again? I'm sorry, I'm like. Um, mind over matter. Yeah. Tricking the brain into believing it's fine when it's, when there's issues. So yeah, no, th definitely that's um, more um, in the psychology realm. And um, I think there are many things that we can do that don't involve drugs to uh, improve just general health, whether it's mental health or physical health. Uh, there are many things that we can do. So I've, for example, when, you know, uh, even before the pandemic hit, I've told everybody, you can improve your immune system by sleeping, you know, sleeping um, well, very underrated in society, in culture, drink lots of fluids, eat a healthy balanced diet, um, get a lot of vitamin D, uh, exercise. So all these things that you can do to improve your general health. But that being said, if your body is attacking itself and has formed lesions, dozens of them, you know, that's when um, really you, you have to take, take medications. That's an uh, area where um, mind over bodies is maybe where, you know, it's kind of limited. But that being said, uh, for example, you know, um, multiple sclerosis patients and uh, neuromyelitis optica patients, migraine patients, you know, definitely there is that um, psychological aspect to it because, you know, uh, just the disease itself makes individuals very, very uh, depressed. And so that's where I think working with a psychologist and working with someone who can help them in that space. Um, so I think of it more as complementary than um, exclusive, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you. Um, and then one other question. I don't know if you're going to talk about like what a typical day is for you, about what your day-to-day -day work life is pre-pandemic. <laughs> Um, but do you mostly work alone or do you work with others or do you have a lot of meetings or, you know, what's your day like? Yeah. So even pre pandemic, I was working from home. So my base is at home, but I would go, 
I would travel quite a bit. So during a uh, given week, maybe three days out of the week, you know, I'd work at home, but then I would go to UCLA or to USC or to UC Irvine or to a medical center. Um, so I would um, travel regionally, locally to be home, you know, a few hours later, but sometimes I would travel um, um, by plane, you know, to, to conferences and congresses or meet with neurologists. I, you know, I, I cover Hawaii. So I would go to Hawaii a few times a year uh, to meet with the neurologists over there. So, um, you know, I cover San Diego. I would go down there um, sometimes. Um, it's, it's good in the sense that I uh, keep my own schedule. I don't report, you know, I don't have to report into anybody daily. But at the same time, um, it can get a little bit lonely when you're out in the field kind of by yourself. Um, but since the pandemic, I feel like I'm in meetings all day long, in Zoom meetings all day long. So uh, because we can't travel anymore and do face-to-face -face visits, um, I end up having to do these presentations through Zoom. Um, and I, my nearest coworker lives in San Francisco. My boss lives in um, Houston. All right, and and that's even in um, normal times. That's where they live. I mean, yeah. okay. that's that's in normal times. So, I I was uh, I was in a lab a lab research scientist for many years, and I left that more for my lifestyle because, you know, I have a lot more flexibility here, you know, in the middle of the day, if I want to um, go to my daughter's um, uh, play or something like that, uh, um, then, or, at, you know, take her to track practice, I can do that because I keep my own schedule. But the flip side is, um, you know, I do travel. I don't mind traveling, but, uh, you know, this would not be a job for someone who um, doesn't enjoy it. Okay, and then is there another question? Is there any special qualities or traits that one should have if they're interested in working in neuroscience field? You know, you really, you have to have to love science. You have to love science because um, you're just not going to make it unless you really love it. Uh, so if it's not something you love, then um, maybe, you know, there are other, other uh, career paths. Uh, but yeah, so definitely that's one thing you need to have is um, uh, love for science. I think it really helps to have a stronger math background just because I find that, you know, math is the foundation of life. So it, it helps. It's not essential, but um, a solid math background um, and just just dedication and just knowing that you are not going to get your reward is immediately. <clears throat> you know, I again, I liken it to you have to be ready for you have to be like a distance runner. You know, you cannot expect a, a, a medal after 100 meters. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with wanting that. It's just you have to be prepared for a longer uh, path. But, uh, you know, I find it very, very rewarding um, nonetheless. So, you know, s solid, strong science, math background, um, inquisitive, um, you know, just, just the questions that you guys are asking me, you know, that tells me you're inquisitive. So I will say that, you know, science, you know, this is a question that comes up, especially during COVID, like, you know, you scientists don't know what you're doing. You keep changing your minds, blah, blah, blah. You know, a lot of negativity around being a scientist. And so what I say, science is not a set of facts. It's really a process of learning. And, you know, and, you know, it's evidence-based. So, you know, I, I tell people the, the coronavirus did not, I, I, I say this because I, I did have to work with, um, on COVID um, since the pandemic. So I worked, I was kind of pulled away from multiple sclerosis for some time, but uh, you know, the, the virus did not come with a set of instructions. 
we had to figure it out with time. And so that's what a scientist does. Um, asks the right question, design the right experiments, gather the right data, interpret it correctly. Um, I know we're running out of time. We only have a couple more minutes, but did you know you wanted to do this when you were in high school at a, at a young age? Or is it through the process of college and picking classes? Uh, so I knew like I wanted to do something science related. My father is a scientist and he took me to the lab when I was a little girl. So I always had, uh, and I always had a curiosity, but I did not know what kind of scientist. When I was in college, I um, was fascinated uh, with the brain and I knew, like I said, it was kind of like the last frontier. And so that's when I um, chose, um, chose, chose this path. But I had, you know, uh, fellow uh, graduate students who, uh, you know, did not have a dad who was a scientist. You know, I had a, um, a friend who, whose family, you know, they were, they were in construction. And so, you know, she just fell in love um, in high school and in college. Okay, thank you. All right. Was that your last slide? I'm not sure if you're... Let me see. Uh, yeah, that was it. That was my last slide. And I put in the chat my email. If you have any uh, questions, you can uh, email me and I'll give you uh, Nora's contact. I know there was a lot of information that, um, that you covered. <laughs> But I thank you for all the questions. Those are some really great questions today. So um, email me, I'll give you her contact info. Um, any last advice for students wanting to pursue this career? Oh, you didn't talk about salary. I know that was one of the things that you talked about um, as far as like a range when you start out, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so I, um, yeah, I, I'm not super comfortable talking about salaries, but that's okay. I can give you a range. Uh, so I will tell you that companies pay more than, um, than universities do. Uh, but that being said, so I think university research scientists, you know, start, start maybe 60K and then go up. Um, but, you know, with, at the university, you have job security, you have a lot of benefits that come with it. Uh, in my job, at a company, you start off around in six figures, and then, and then move and move up. So, so something like that. Um, with a PhD, um, maybe it's not sixty anymore. Maybe it's like closer to seventy or eighty thousand. But yeah, with a PhD, you 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 start off likely at a at six six figure salary, and then okay, grow up, yeah. Great, any other questions? If not, um, thank you for your time and really appreciate it. And if again, email me and I will send along her email. Thank you everybody. Thanks for having me, great questions.